When I was in grade 12, I had a physics teacher who showed us a documentary on the last 10 pages of the physics textbook. Now, this is the part of the textbook where you're not supposed to read or you read on your own time, or it's the part where it's kind of outside of the curriculum itself. But he showed us this, so I woke up on one day, I had breakfast, went to school, thought it'd be a normal day, went into my physics class, and my mind exploded. So, you know when you go to the gym and you have your before and after selfie to show progress? I have a before and after photo of when I learned about Einstein's theory of relativity. So this is the before photo, if we go back. So this is the before photo, you know, going to school, normal day, going to hang out with my friends, grade 12, I think it was around prom, uh, relaxing, going to my physics class, and then, boom, my brain hurt because I learned about theory of relativity, and I literally felt my mind explode. I actually went home, and I was mad at my parents for not telling me earlier. We were at the dinner table, and they were like, so what'd you do at school today? And I was like, no, there's not enough time for this. Listen, why didn't you tell me about space-time curvature? And my dad and my mom were like, we didn't know you wanted to know about this. Also, we don't even really know what this is. But it inspired something within me, and I wondered why I was so fascinated about it, because when you look at mystery and what inspires people, it's different, it's subjective. So over the years, it was funny because it was actually May 10th, 2014, so it's actually the 10th year anniversary of my mind exploding. But after that, I began to think, well, what was it about the theory of relativity and gravity that inspired me and that led me to then pursuing engineering physics, working as an aerospace engineer, and then starting my own portable robotics company. And when I pondered on it, I realized that I discovered a very, very deep insight on the human experience. So what if I told you that I have a secret about the human experience on the source of what leads to innovation, invention, and new creations? What if I told you that you've probably shared these same experiences? You've had your own aha moments that have led to what you're doing today. And there's big versions of this, there's small versions of this, but ultimately they come from the same place. I'll give you a clue. It has seven letters and three syllables. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you mystery. 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 I kind of sound like Bill Nye the Science Guy. But mystery is the source of innovation. And I'll explain what that means. Because when you look at innovation and breakthroughs, it often stems from an initial aspect of curiosity and something that challenges your initial thoughts. So for me, with the space-time curvature, that was a mystery aspect for me. And what I realized is that mystery is a fundamental element of the human experience. So there's different aspects. It's not just technology, even though my background's in engineering. But if we take music, for example, so there's a lot of famous composers that have built and created a number of masterpieces that we still listen to today. So for myself, I play piano, I love jazz music, and I love minor chords. Any musicians in the audience by chance? Show of hands. Yeah, some musicians. So you probably know minor chords are a little more mysterious. They're more dissonant and not scary. When I say mysterious, I mean mysterious in a good way, not scary. I don't watch any horror movies. I think the scariest movie I saw as a kid was Cat in the Hat. Something about a six-foot-tall cat scared me. But I don't watch horror movies. Basically, mystery on the lines of interest, fascination, wonder, and awe. So in music, when you look at minor chords, they're interesting. And there's composers like Mozart, Debussy, when you look at Claire de Lune, or La Mer. These all stem from areas of mystery, La Mer especially because it focuses on the mystery of the deep sea. And minor chords lead to this dissonance and mystery, whereas uh, major chords are more triumphant, more victorious. So I'm sure you've listened to a song, and you actually wonder, why do I actually like this song? What is it about this chord progression that's interesting? And oftentimes, if you actually reverse engineer it, it's linked to mystery in some way. We also have other composers as well, like Hans Zimmer, for instance. Hans Zimmer also would normally work late at night, and a lot of his compositions link to minor chords, minor chord progressions, and coming from an element of mystery. And when you blend mystery with storytelling, you get film and movies. And that allows you to actually expand on the creative expression and engagement that audiences feel from an emotional standpoint. But it's not just music. We also have art. So anyone who paints here in the audience, any painters or sculptors, yeah, in the back, awesome. So art is a very mysterious, a creative form as well. 
So when you look at individuals like Vincent van Gogh, for instance, he had a fascination about uh, Starry Night, about the night sky. And when he was creating his uh, masterpiece, he linked it to that mystery that he felt at night, looking up at the stars. So when he painted Starry Night, it allowed him to expand and express his creative vision for mystery. And now we've been able to actually have exhibitions where we go and we're able to kind of dive deep into his initial emotions that he felt when he painted that picture. Salvador Dali is another example. So Salvador Dali used to dream quite a bit and he always loved the mystery of dreaming. So a lot of his art pieces actually related to what he saw in his dreams. That's why some of them were a little distorted, but it started from that initial place of mystery and excitement for how dreams actually work. So when you expand on that creative expression, you then lead to very exciting fields, such as art galleries, which weren't a thing of the past, but now are actually prevalent, and you have VR art galleries as well that expand on this initial vision of mystery, excitement, and interest. So in addition to art, obviously we have a bird here. So what is this bird doing here? So as I mentioned, my background is in aerospace engineering as well. So this is one of my favorite examples of how you can start with mystery and then actually build something meaningful. So birds obviously can fly, spoiler alert. But there was a time in humanity where we thought flying was impossible. We literally thought that it was impossible, kind of like perpetual motion today, where if someone said, oh yeah, we'd be able to fly, humans would be able to fly across the world, you'd be made fun of, but now we can fly. We can have over 100, up to 800 people flying across the world. And when you looked at the Wright brothers at the time, they were very fascinated with the mystery of flight. Why are birds able to fly? Obviously humans biologically are different from animals. When you look at birds and their uh, uh, biomechanics and the lightness of their, their feathers and, and anatomy. But what they did is they studied lift and how the fluid uh, dynamics and mechanics worked around their wings specifically, and started building early designs and prototypes for the modern day, uh, modern day aircraft. So now we have aircraft that can literally travel thousands of miles across the world. If you were to bring people from the past into the present, they would be totally amazed. And it stemmed from an initial inspiration and interest in the mystery of flight. So as a final example, bringing it back to my initial day where I was, where I had my mind blown essentially, Physics and mathematics is a big field that stems from mystery. So I like to call each of these instances moments of mystery. And I definitely encourage you to think back to a time where you experienced some element of mystery, whether it was something in a science class or art or music, or even just trying to understand why squirrels can eat nuts and are super intelligent, but then can't cross the road without getting hit by a car. There's many different examples of mystery but there's different sizes. There's big ones that can lead to big breakthroughs and innovations, and then there's small ones that can inspire you and lead you to your future career. When we look at mathematics, especially with Einstein, obviously he started with his equations for general relativity, explaining gravity, in a nutshell, the TLDR of Einstein's theory of relativity. General theory of relativity deals with really big things and how space-time curvature works, explaining gravity. Special relativity is when things move really fast and how that affects space and time. That's the very condensed version. I could stand here for hours explaining, and even then, there'd be more time uh, allocated. So, for instance, with uh, Einstein, with his initial equations, it led to really cool applications in space, like the global positioning system, the GPS, and satellites that we still use today. So each of those, actually, if we go back one slide, so each of those are different moments of mystery. And as you can see, it spans across all different industries, not just tech and science, but art, music, creative expression, fashion, business, tech. And it's interesting because when you look at how mystery pl uh, plays a part into passion, each of those individuals were passionate, right? Without a doubt. Einstein, Vincent van Gogh, Hans Zimmer, they love their craft. They almost go into a flow state when they're building and creating. And then the question is for you, when you're thinking about your own passions and what you want to pursue in life, or if you're already in your career and you want to make a change or you want to expand and grow, it's interesting to look at how you can reverse engineer something that you're passionate about. Because passion is almost like the destination. So how do we get there? Well, mystery is one way to get there. So when you reverse engineer passion, curiosity is a big theme. Because all of these individuals were curious. Einstein always used to say that he's passionately curious. So he's passionate about just being curious. 
But where should you be curious? Are you curious about the floor? Wow, this is a great floor. Wow, that's a great wall. How do you navigate and figure out where to start your curiosity? So I have uh, a solution for you. And the solution is mystery. So you can look at mystery almost like a compass, which we had on the previous slide, to navigate to where you can apply your curiosity. So any area within an industry where there's some mystery or something that hasn't been solved, that's where you can start to apply your curiosity. And that'll lead to new findings, new innovations, and it'll be fun and exciting for you because that's how our brain works. It works on a reward system where you put in some work, you get a reward, and that incentivizes you to do it again. So when we look at this rotation here, this is kind of like the framework for starting with mystery, obviously on the left. Then that leads to curiosity because there's different elements that you're curious about and then leading to new findings. And then that's kind of like a cyclical loop that will go on essentially infinitely if you're working at this for a long time. And this leads to a flow state. I'm not sure, has anyone here heard of what a flow state is or have heard that exactly? So a lot of the musicians are putting their hands up. It's very common in music when you see people who are, for instance, jazz music, uh, musicians and they're improvising on a, a new jazz piece, they go into this state where it's almost like they're unaware of their environment and they're solely focused on creative expression and also trying new things without the fear of failure. And there's been so many studies in neuroscience and psychology to understand how we can get into that flow state for longer periods of time. This is one of the ways you can do that because you're starting in an area where there's a bit of uncertainty, but healthy uncertainty, and then you're applying your curiosity, for instance, if you're a musician, trying some new chord progressions, and then you get the feedback reward system of, wow, that sounded really good, and then you go on to improvise more, and you get that feedback system again. But it's not only just music, it's art, even mathematicians when they're doing proofs. If you can get into that flow state, it is really, really great, and you also increase your productivity. So we're going to do a quick exercise right now. I want you to close your eyes and think about a time where you were recently inspired or thought of or inspired by a mystery around you. It could be a mystery novel that you're reading. It could be a film that you recently watched where the plot was not what you expected. It could be, as I mentioned, the squirrel. Any little thing where you're like, wow, that's really interesting. And I want you to, to know something very interesting. So, your, what you find mysterious is not the same as the person sitting next to you. So why is that? There's obviously things that are objectively mysterious that we can agree upon, but what interests you is different from the person next to you. So the next step would be, what are you curious about in that domain? So say you're interested about uh, new textiles for a new fabric, if you're interested in fashion, for instance, that's maybe sustainable. What aspect of that is interesting to you, and what aspect of that makes you curious? And when you start to think about that, you're actually learning more about yourself and what excites you, because it is subjective. It's not the same for the person sitting next to you. So as we go through the next little set of uh, exercises, definitely keep that in mind. So as we continue with that exercise, what you'll notice is that within that field that you're thinking of, there's the aspect that you know. So say you know about textiles and fashion, you know how it's made, you know about the polymers. Then you know what you don't know, uh, this is a very common uh, circle as well. I'm not sure if you've seen it before, so I'll explain it slowly. But first there's the element that you know, right? So maybe you know about textiles. Then there's the area that you don't know, but you know that you need to learn it, right? So it's not like a massive unknown. Maybe you don't know about the manufacturing, or you don't know how to source it. But then there's areas that you don't know that you don't know. And that's where it gets into the mystery aspect. And that's led to a lot of breakthroughs in science, physics, education. And that's the really exciting part, because as long as you move towards that mystery box, which is basically unknown unknowns, that's where you get inspiration and big breakthroughs. So this is kind of like an extension of that. So on the bottom axis here, we have unknown, and on the vertical axis, we have known. So as things become more unknown and more out of our reach, we kind of get put more into the mysterious zone. And that's one of the reasons why you can be in a flow state for so long because it never ends. You get that cyclical reward system over and over, and you're able to apply that uh, in your own life. So now we know some examples of moments of mystery. We know how the mystery works with mystery, curiosity, and then new findings. But why do our brains love mystery so much? 
I mean, even myself, I used to love, I still love, I, I love Scooby-Doo, and I loved it as a kid, I still love it, and this element of mystery is something that's just part of human existence. But there's a lot of neuroscience behind it. So one is novelty. Our brains love new experiences. Our brains get used to things very quickly, obviously with the reward systems of dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin. Mystery is one of those things that is new, and it creates an, uh, a feedback system within your reward system that's new and novel every time. The second is uncertainty. So I want to preface, there's two different types of uncertainty. Obviously, if you're in a jungle, or you've been you know, stranded on an island and you need to find food, that is not a healthy uncertainty. That's going to lead to stress, obviously, and is a little more negative. But there's healthy uncertainty, where you're working within a certain constraint, and you're, you have freedom to fail, but there's not negative consequences, right? So if you're improvising, unless it's like in a, maybe a live environment and you're trying to get into university, even then, if you get into a flow state, you can kind of, uh, you can ignore what's around you and focus directly on what you're trying to pursue. But the combination of novelty and uncertainty is great for the brain because it creates new connections, you're increasing your gray matter, and you're allowing yourself to expand what you already know and look at new problems and how you can solve it. So ultimately, why do we love mystery? One, curiosity and wonder. Two, intellectually challenge, uh, intellectual challenges. So when you're building a puzzle or you're playing a video game, these are all intellectual challenges that allow you to apply what you've learned and try to solve a puzzle, a maze, and actually get that reward system of completing it. Emotional engagement. So as I mentioned with Vincent van Gogh, Debussy, they're all creating musical pieces that evoke a feeling of wonder and awe, and that's why they live on forever. Entertainment and storytelling. So when you apply these in a grand scale and you have more resources, you can build films, you can build art museums, and this is part of human. Humans are social beings, and we have culture, and when you combine that with an element of uncertainty and mystery, it tends to live on for a long period of time. And also, evolutionarily, if you're venturing out, looking for new land, looking for new food, you're going to be rewarded. Obviously, sometimes you might not be rewarded, maybe if there's an animal or a tiger, but you learn each part of the way, and over time, it's a net positive outcome. So it's always good to practice that muscle of curiosity, looking for mystery, and then trying to create new findings from that. So ultimately, my final, uh, my final request for you is to venture out, look for new mysteries, look at how you can apply what you've learned, because ultimately, when you reach that unknown, unknown territory, you're going to create new breakthroughs that will help the future. Thank you.